Special thanks to Savers for sponsoring our 125,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. If you want to find out how you can win one of six lightsabers, check the pinned comment down below. Hello. Our story begins in a council debriefing on Naboo. Qui-Gon Jinn was dead. The Sith had returned. Jedi Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi was a victor of the duel that transpired mere hours before. One of the members on the High Council, Wookiee Jedi Master Divoka, believed that Qui-Gon had been telling the truth about the return of the Sith. To see that Master Jin perished due to the Council's moral superiority disheartened him, but Tavoka was more concerned about the effect Jin's death would have on Dooku. The Wookiee Jedi Master typically sat in the middle of both ends of the spectrum. He disagreed with the Jedi's humility, and he also disagreed with the radicalism of Jedi like Dooku and Qui-Gon. Blunt would be the best word to describe Tavoka. He listened to his peers as Yoda brought up the fact that Obi-Wan made a promise to Qui-Gon. Many of the Council were in a disagreement with the idea of Kenobi taking on Skywalker as a student, but if it was a promise made by a dying wish, then perhaps they could allow Obi-Wan to oversee Skywalker's training. Tevoka spoke up, disagreeing with the entire premise. The Council knew this would be good. Tevoka was never short for words, and he always spoke his mind articulately and with bluntness. He called them fools for believing that Kenobi was ready to train Anakin. They looked to him, and he asked them if they remembered Kenobi's stiffness towards the kid. He didn't like him, he didn't want to bring him to Coruscant, and it was very clear that Kenobi thought the same as many council members did. Why would they put someone that was the prophesied chosen one into the hands of someone that didn't want to train them? Let Kenobi make his decision on when he wanted to train a student, not force Anakin onto him. Qui-Gon made Obi-Wan promise something so Anakin could be trained. Why play this game of back and forth when they all knew the truth? Qui-Gon rightly placed his faith in Kenobi, but he did it not because of Obi-Wan, but because he wanted Skywalker to become a Jedi. Tyvoker stopped and took a deep breath. As a Wookiee, it was natural to be temperamental. As a Jedi, it was his responsibility to be more than that. He told the Council that their reluctance to see the truth was blinding them from a potential chance to ensure balance remained prevalent. Tyvoker then informed them all that he would train Skywalker himself upon their return to Coruscant. They needed to inform Kenobi so he could pass the knowledge down to Anakin. The Jedi Masters looked to each other, and in consensus, they agreed. Tyvoka's tone may have not been how they wanted to hear it, but he was right. The remaining ceremonies on Naboo would commence. The binding of the Gungans and the Naboo, the burning of Qui-Gon, and the return to Coruscant. Skywalker was informed and he spent the majority of the trip trying to figure out what a Wookiee was, and why he was being passed off. Kenobi was relieved. He was worried about training Skywalker and now he was free from that burden. He didn't think he was ready to train Anakin, let alone a regular Jedi Padawan. With the grieving of his master, the extra burden weighed him down. Perhaps Qui-Gon intended for this to actually happen, hoping that Obi-Wan's promise would elicit a council member to step up and make the right decision. It seems Tyvoka was that Jedi. When they returned to Coruscant, Tyvoka and Anakin walked together, leaving the Jedi transport and walking into the halls of the temple. The Wookiee Jedi Master did everything he could to familiarize Skywalker with the layout and where his room was inside the temple. This was his new home, and he needed to know where everything was. Tyvoka also explained some other things during their walk, telling Skywalker that instead of going off with the other younglings, he would complete his formal training with him. This would be their way to catch him up to the other younglings. If Skywalker wanted to partake in youngling classes after that, then that was his choice. If not, then they would continue the way they had up until the decision needed to be made. Skywalker understood this, but it was still a lot to take in. The temple was huge. It was unified. There weren't battles or death or chaos. It was all one order, one community of people. The little tour of the temple would take over an hour, and Tyvoka even introduced his new student to his most recent one, which was Plo Koon. The Jedi Knight was preparing to begin the training of his first student, which Tyvoka was excited about. It was about time Plo took on his own student. Despite how close both Jedi were, Tyvoka definitely didn't hold back on giving Plo a tough time. Plo was taking on a young Balin Skull who was only a couple years older than Anakin. The following few days would be full of growing pains. Master and Apprentice had to get used to each other, and Anakin had to be instructed the basics. While Tovoka didn't necessarily agree with the age limit, he understood why they had it. Teaching someone the force above the age of three was painful. When a child is young, they are a sponge, so information sticks to them. The older an individual gets, the more difficult the training becomes. It turns into a tug of war between things that individual knows and doesn't know. They're held back by traumas and self-doubt. Anakin wasn't just held back, but he was holding himself back. He was very susceptible to the ways of the Force. 
he very easily could use a force. However, he was the worst listener. Luckily, Tyvoka was old, like really old, so he had no issue with patience. But that wilky temper started to rise. He was just hoping that these were simply growing pains. They weren't. Master and Apprentice worked through each of the basics, harmonizing, meditation, trusting, becoming one with the force, allowing yourself to release negative emotions and energies and breathing through the universe. It wasn't that there couldn't be bad memories or experiences, but one's perception of such moments in life determines how they affect you for the rest of your time. Tyvoka's mastery of the Jedi Way was amazing, and Skywalker did try to keep up, but early on, it proved that once Anakin started wielding the Force, he didn't want to actually listen. Due to being a product of the Force, it was easy to connect to it, and that made Anakin arrogant in his ways. Tevoka continuously warned Anakin from his arrogance, and told him that his overconfidence would be his greatest weakness. Skywalker continued to neglect these direct lessons, even as they eventually, after the first couple years of training, got into lightsaber combat. By this point, Anakin was 14 years old. Tyvoka sent Plo to Tatooine to free Shmi and any number of slaves he could, which was accomplished by the master and Padawan duo of Plo and Balin. Anakin obviously was appreciative for this, but he seemed to lack any real care for the Jedi way. There was a constant bickering between these two Jedi. Tyvoka held Anakin to a high standard, and one day during their lightsaber training, Tyvoka's Wookiee rage snapped. They were going through another rough patch. Tyvoka always made sure he was patient with Skywalker and showed him the reins, teaching him how to use the force and the wheel of the blade. Anakin was obsessed with his glow stick and trained with it consistently. Tyvoka never mind this, but the young Jedi believed that his usage of the blade would make him a strong opponent. It did. For his age, he was certainly talented, but it took years to master a saber form. It took a lifetime to master every, and yet at the end of that mastery, there was still lessons that could be learned. One can never learn enough. Anakin didn't care. These little profound quotes went in one ear and out the other. So as the two Jedi were sparring, working on Form 1, Anakin got a little too hasty. He started forward and thrust his blade, trying to impress his master. Instead, Tyvoka, who was simply going through the motions, was cut across the wrist. Nothing deep, just a little burn, but it put him into a state of incurable rage. His blood boiled and his eyes filled with rage. Anakin saw his mistake and immediately tried to apologize, but Tyvoka had already snapped. He threw his lightsaber onto the ground and reached his hand out, ripping Anakin off the ground and hoisting him into the air with the force. He looked dead into Anakin's eyes and called him the most disgraceful student he ever encountered. Tyvoka stood before the council to ensure he wasn't thrown back into that slave pit on Tatooine. Tyvoka sent his last student to Tatooine to save Anakin's mother, and after all this time, Skywalker refused to listen to a simple lesson. It was ridiculous. There is absolutely no way that this should be in any way acceptable behavior. Anakin thought he was going to be killed, and Tyvoka's voice cracked. He was so upset. It wasn't just rage, but pain. Any student within this order would have done anything to have one-on-one -on -one training with a council member, and Skywalker acted like he was entitled to it. Tyvoka came back to the moment and saw the terror in his student's eyes, and so he slowly lowered him to the ground. He took a deep breath and apologized for acting out in such a way. Anakin was silent, but he realized, out of all the times he allowed his master's words to go in one ear and out the other, this time they finally stuck. He felt terrible. He did so much to make this training process difficult for his instructor, and now we saw what he was doing to his mentality. Tavoka tried to be patient, and he tried to get Anakin to understand, and for the first time ever, he finally really did. He saw what his actions did to his instructor, so instead of accepting Tavoka's apology, he apologized. Anakin looked to the ground and then back to his master, who towered over him, and said that he was sorry for never taking his lessons seriously. Ever since he connected to the Force, he forgot how easy he had it, and how gifted he was. Maybe if they could continue their instruction, he could get it right, and he wouldn't mess up this time. He promised he would stop being so headstrong and try to slow down. Tavoka was appreciative for Anakin's self-reflection, but he was still in the wrong. Though this moment would completely alter their lives forever, it was the singular instant that certified the bond between Master and Apprentice, where both Tavoka and Anakin realized that to be a successful duo, it took both sides, and for Anakin, he needed to be a successful student. There would eventually come a point where he would be a master, and when that time came, he needed to be willing to continue learning. Anakin's headstrong attitude was always there. It just took some time for it to show itself. So no matter who instructed Skywalker, it wouldn't have changed his demeanor once understanding his own gifts. Now that he was able to put those feelings aside, Skywalker would have a chance to become one with his teacher. He could listen to everything told to him, 
and he would actually listen to the words of wisdom that Tyvoka passed down. With a solid line and barrier of trust growing between the duo, Tyvoka brought Anakin into the Force of Kashyyyk. The Wookiee Jedi Master was specially attuned to the Force. The Force was very good about giving him insight into what was to come, and he knew that for Anakin to finally harness his own sense of balance, he had to trust what he couldn't. To be a Jedi required control, especially control of moments which their faith was tested. Due to Tyvoka's foresight, he felt confident in what he was about to do. Anakin and his master walked through the forest for a day or two until they eventually came upon a nest of some sort. Anakin asked what it was, and Tyvoka stepped back, telling Anakin that this was his next test. The ground began to rumble when a massive beast showed itself. The Wookiee Jedi was more than familiar with the massive Tarentatech beasts from his home world. They were vile creatures, however, if one was able to harness the force to calm their heart, then they would, by nature, be able to connect themselves with the animal. Despite their lack of thinking, animals were incredibly spiritual. Tevoka walked around, watching a student prep his lightsaber and move to defend himself. The Jedi Master understood these teachings of animals from his own people's philosophies. The Wookiees were very close to their natural land, so they were very quick to trust and harmonize with it. For Skywalker, this would be a difficult task. The young Jedi continued to bounce around, using the force to shove the beast backwards before slashing at it. Tavoka chose the Tarentatek because Anakin wasn't skilled enough to kill the beast, let alone harm it mortally. Tavoka knew that Anakin would choose to fight the monster, but the monster was simply defending his home. Anakin moved into an offensive position, and then from the corner of his eyes he could see his master standing in the distance with his arms crossed. Perhaps he had gone about this the wrong way. An arm from the massive beast swept upwards and hit Anakin out of the air and threw him into a dream, forcing his lightsaber into a location of which he couldn't see it. Tevoka watched his student fail without budging. The Tarentatech hissed and moved forward as it slammed his hands down to the ground. Anakin looked at his master and then within an instant, he chose the Force. He realized that he was ignoring his master's instructions. The animal was defending itself. It reacted due to Anakin's reaction. He got defensive and the animal became offensive. It was like waves of the air, to the force. The spiritual bond between Anakin and the beast was serenaded with hostility, but now Skywalker needed to bridge that gap. Anakin calmed his breathing. He looked at the torrent attack that towered over him. It was a beautiful animal, and it slowed down its breathing as he calmed down his own nerves. Skywalker smiled and closed his eyes, and pressed his left hand against the ground, feeling the grass and soil under his fingers. The dew soaked into his palms and he could feel the planet itself breathe. And just as he could feel the planet, the beast before him could be felt too. Skywalker smiled some more, his teeth glimmering ever so slightly. Anakin's right hand lifted from his waist and he reached up into the air. A shallow breeze crossed through the small pass where the nest sat. He could feel the animal's heart through the force as it lowered itself, and then shortly after the beating slowed down to a rest, he could feel the beast's breath as it got closer to him. Skywalker felt the call to open his eyes, but he remained still. A sense of pure joy rose to his body, and with this moment of peace, it came to its conclusion when the Tarentatech lightly placed his face upon Anakin's hand, before pulling back softly and thinning up to his true height and moving away, so that Anakin could return to his master. Skywalker could feel each step taken, and his eyes slowly opened and he turned to his master with the widest grin. Anakin jumped up and ran over to Tyvoka and then jumped up and down in front of him, asking if he saw that. Tavoka smiled and patted Anakin on the head, informing him that he had done well. His first steps into a larger world were now complete. Tavoka wrapped his arm around Anakin's shoulders and turned him into the direction they came from. They spoke about Anakin's experience and what he learned from it. The two Jedi would complete another mission before returning to Coruscant, where Tavoka, along with the rest of the council, would be called upon to visit the Chancellor. The Wookiee Jedi Master had a weird ick with Palpatine, so he hadn't seen or been around him since Naboo. However, something had changed. The Wookiee Jedi Master stood behind his peers, towering over them and listening to Palpatine. As he listened, Tavoka felt his head swell, and he stepped back. Shocked, he looked at him and asked what was wrong, before he excused himself and walked out of the room. Mace turned and looked at Shakti, nodding before she too excused herself so she could see what was wrong. In the next room, she found Tavoka sitting on a couch quietly, rubbing his temple and breathing shallowly. She asked what was bothering him, and he asked her, if there was something negative about Palpatine, Shakti confirmed that there was something, but she didn't know what. Tevoka nodded his head, and then continued, suggesting that he had a vision. He was looking at Palpatine, and he could see Anakin kneeling before him. He could see the Jedi Order fall behind him, and lastly, Palpatine was Maul's instructor. Shakti asked how that could be possible, and the Jedi Master shook his head. He was unsure, but he told her 
that they needed to begin a formal investigation into the Chancellor. She looked at him with a face of concern, one begging the question if he understood what he was suggesting. His confidence confirmed it. She turned back and said that they should wait until the council were gathered inside their chambers. The whole process would go as expected. Tavoka would make his claim before the Jedi and suggest an investigation inside their chambers. He used them being wrong about Maul's return and the Sith return as grounds for an investigation, which they accepted and they followed. This was especially because Tavoka wasn't typically the one to cry Lothwolf. wolf. The Wookiee Jedi Master would return to training his student, noticing that Anakin had interacted with Palpatine a few times. He considered using Anakin as bait, but that would be wrong in his eyes. The mission was the burden of the Council, not Skywalker. Tavoka would continue challenging his student though. For the next several months, as the hunt for the truth regarding Palpatine continued, Anakin and Tavoka would train harder than ever before. By this point, Anakin was 15, and Tavoka believed that this was a proper time to make Anakin understand what it meant to wield the blade. Before, he didn't go easy, but he also refrained from going hard. As a Wookiee, it could be very easy for him to overpower Anakin. Tavoka was used to this, because it was the same for his student Plo, but because Plo was a Doran, he had a much better advantage than Anakin did during these spars. Regardless of that, Tavoka was prepared to fully instruct Anakin and the Blade. Luckily for him, he, Skywalker, and Plo were all users of Form 5, so he'd be teaching another student how to use the form. Anakin was trained in saber combat, but he was never trained hard, especially because all the training during his initial years as a student were just introducing the basics and how to use Form 1 and 5 at a basic level. Tavoka always waited until the student was 15 years old until he finally started fully training them. This was for a lot of reasons, but the main reason was because a student could typically hold their own long enough by this point in their career. Tavoka knew Anakin had been training relentlessly, waiting for the moment when they might spar again. There hadn't been a true spar since Tavoka snapped. Now this was their chance for a rematch. They both moved past the incident and readied themselves. Skywalker wasn't cocky like he was before, but he was ready for this. Their blades were drawn and they moved against each other. Immediately, Anakin felt the difference. For a Wookiee, Tyvoka moved with speed and ferocity. He was limber on his feet, he balanced off the balls of his feet, and his strikes were crushing. Anakin spun back, switching to Form 3, which he barely knew. It was a wise move because that's what Tyvoka wanted his student to do. Anakin's master smashed his blade down three times against Anakin's block before stepping back. He howled, telling Anakin that a strong defense was the key to victory. He continued from there, telling his student that no matter how big or small, a Jedi must be prepared for any sized rival. Skywalker spun his blade and charged. Tyvoka grinned, ducking under the strike, spinning his blade behind his back and twirling it into a reverse grip before sliding it across, throwing Anakin back. The strikes were heavy, but Skywalker recovered every time. This was what Tyvoka yearned for. His student needed to have the determination to persevere. It decided the difference between life and death. Anakin slid his blade forward and Tyvoka backed up, planting his dominant foot and using the power to throw Skywalker backwards and into the ground. Tyvoka deep knighted the weapon and reached his hand forward for Skywalker, who looked up. The Wookiee Jedi told his student he had done well. There would come a day when he would beat him in combat, but before that, he had to get in line behind Plo. The Wookiee laughed a little at his own joke before hoisting Anakin off the ground and patting his student on the head once more. Within the coming weeks, the truth would be revealed about Palpatine and the Counts would make their move. They would run a security detail for him, telling the public that the Sith had returned and they were setting up new patrols to ensure he was protected. Palpatine didn't understand this little game they were playing, but he did everything he could to avoid these little guarding parties. During one of them, Tavoka would straight up snap Palpatine's neck, especially when he least expected it. The word that became public was that the Senate guards weren't an effective force and that the Sith were a larger threat than what they were initially believed to be. Tyvoka and the Council came up with this plan. It was entirely made up so that the Senate could be used to turn the people of the Republic against the Sith. That was all they wanted, and it was exactly what they got. As a result, the Jedi believed they had finally won the war against the Sith. They had no idea that Dooku was serving Palpatine. The Senate saw the foul play as Sith intervention, and brought to life old bills that were stored away and long forgotten about. It was a brilliant move by the Council, and they continued to prop up their Jedi propaganda, suggesting that they would find the Sith Lord and destroy it. With the Sith back in the spotlight, it would prepare the Republic for a plot that went right back to the man who set everything to motion. A few years after Palpatine's death, Sidious's Clone War plan was ready to go, and the Jedi had no idea what to expect. While Dooku wasn't Sidious, he had everything Palpatine wanted to accomplish laid out in front of him. All Dooku needed to do was make it work. 
Dooku had to wait this long because it took this long to actually get everyone to rally to his side. He tried to attack the galaxy before the clones were finished, but he couldn't get that done fast enough. There also wouldn't be assassination attempts on Padme without Palpatine, and therefore there'd be no reason for Anakin to be her guard. Without the attacks on Padme, there would be no way for the Jedi to discover Kamino. Therefore, what instead transpired before the beginning of the Clone Wars was Master and Apprentice completing Anakin's training and allowing him to become a Jedi Knight, something Anakin welcomed with great pride. Once the knighting ceremony was over, Anakin and Tyvoka sat on the steps of the temple, overlooking the city. Skywalker was thinking about his attachments, the one specifically to his mother. He hadn't seen her in four years, but she was free and doing well. Anakin had seen a lot of Padme on the news as of late. There were tensions and one half of the galaxy felt like it was splitting away from the Republic. Seeing her on the news was intoxicating for him. So he asked his master a question, one that was so simple but heavy. Anakin asked his master if he loved him. The Wookiee Jedi looked across the skyline of Coruscant, the final sunset before the war began, one that neither Jedi was aware of. Tavoku told a student that he did, as he loved Plo and the Council, his friends, and every other Jedi. He loved them all because, as Jedi, they were in their own right encouraged to love. The only challenge with love is how inebriating it can be. Love is a drug, no matter what form it comes from, familial, romantic, or companionship. Tavoku told a student that to harbor love was to be sentient, to have and feel emotions was what they all were. But how they control them is what made a Jedi a Jedi. For an individual to let go in a moment's notice was the difference between the people and the Jedi. Tavoka turned to his student and told him that if he had to choose between Anakin and the entire planet of Coruscant, he would choose Coruscant, because as a Jedi, that was his mandate. If Anakin decided that to love was a path he wanted to go down, then that was something he needed to prepare himself for. Would he be able to let go when it came to it? Anakin nodded his head and quietly looked back over the city. Tavoka told his student that no matter what path he chose in life, he had faith in him. As a Jedi Knight, he was more than capable than any Jedi he had ever come across. His turnaround was remarkable. To hold that dedication alone would be challenging, but it wasn't something that Tyvoka believed to be an impossible task for Anakin. The Jedi Master patted Anakin on the head again before getting up and wishing his former student a good night. The thoughts that plagued Anakin wouldn't be much of a concern. He'd be whisked away into the front lines of combat. A war began. Dooku Separatists engaged with a shipping yard not far from the core. Without a standing army, the Republic panicked, but thanks to the Kaminoans, they informed the Galactic Republic of their new army, and very quickly, the war kicked into overdrive. With hostilities being shown against the ruling government of the galaxy, the people rallied behind the clones, the Senate, and the Jedi. Tavoka and Anakin would sign up to serve with the same division. Their bond was strong, and they believed that the best way to combat the rise of the war would be with each other. Due to Dooku not needing Palpatine's approval to win the war, the Countess Sereno employed Ventress and Grievous in attacks on the Republic. Their usage would be permanent, and he planned on them being integral to the beginning of his evil empire. Grievous was given the command of the Malevolence and sent to hunt down Republic fleets. The super ship would remain a problem for the Republic until Tyvoka's fleet countered it, and with the piloting skills of Anakin, they were able to defeat the weapon. Because Dooku was constantly trying to actually win the war, the Republic was immediately put onto his heels, and the Jedi were also requested to do something against their code. The Senate dispatched them to assassinate Dooku. The Clone Wars was a slaughter. Without a need for power in the Senate, Dooku was free to make a push to win the war alone. He did remain elusive, as did his agents of evil. He didn't want a single one of them to be cornered by the Jedi, but he always knew he would be the main target. Everything Dooku did was a counter to the Jedi. He used holograms to show up at CIS government meetings. He made sure every attempt on him was met with losses. The Jedi and Clone Commando squads incurred hundreds of casualties in the first few months due to being let in the traps. The tragedy of the war led Anakin to ask Tyvoka on his thoughts on the war. The Jedi Master expressed that the galaxy was in a need of a great reset. The Wookiee Jedi believed they could win the war, but in the circumstance that they did not, it was a natural progression of how things must go. It was clear enough people were willing to believe Dooku and see that there were wrongs with the Jedi and the Republic. In order to fix this imbalance, something needed to change. Whether that meant the Jedi or the Republic needed to die, then so be it. If it meant the CIS would crumble and the Standing Order learned his lesson, then so be it. And despite Tyvoka's apparent peace with the entire thing, he was very adamant on one issue. Dooku needed to be killed. Anakin agreed, and he was eager to be responsible for that death. Tyvoka reminded Anakin what Dooku was. He was a generational talent. 
if he ever came across him, he needed to be fought with precision and caution. Dooku could win any duel, if given enough time. As the war became a rout, the Jedi realized their days were numbered, and they dispatched Councilmember Coleman Trevor with Tyvoka and Skywalker to hunt down and kill Dooku. There were rumors floating around that he, Ventress, and Grievous were preparing for their attack on Coruscant. If the Jedi failed here, then within the span of seven months, the Republic would crumble. The three Jedi understood what they were supposed to do. The only reason more council members weren't going with them was because the council was divided up to go into spare locations in case it was a setup. These pairs were all pairs of three, and they had enough masterful Jedi to make this work if the Sith forces were actually split up, which they thought they were. The Republic tried to make contact with the Separatists, who believed Dooku had gone too far, but he blocked all communications with Raxus and Coruscant. The Republic didn't even have a chance to surrender, call for a ceasefire, or propose a counter to the war peacefully. Dooku intended on wiping out the entire system of government in one go. The three leaders of the CIS stood on the bridge of a capital ship, where Dooku informed them of their plans. They were going to go to Coruscant in three separate waves. Asajj would take the ground immediately, block off all passages to the lower levels, while Grievous would blast the Republic from space. Dooku had the reserve fleet. At one point or another, Grievous was bound to win, so the reserve fleet was kept for once Republic reinforcements started to come from other locations across the core. It was a perfect strategy, but before the fleet could be sent out across the galaxy, a voice rang out over Dooku's shoulders, one telling him that his rebellion was over. Dooku turned over to see two council members and the promised Chosen One. He turned his head to Grievous and Ventress, telling them to destroy the Jedi, win the war. Dooku then told the deckhand to launch the fleet into hyperspace. Regardless of the victor here, he wouldn't sacrifice his win over the Republic. The droids had their programming, and they outnumbered the clones. Even if he died or all three of them died, there would be no saving the Jedi nor the government they served. Coleman, Tyvoka, and Skywalker rush forward. Grievous challenged the Wookiee and Verk Jedi Masters. Their blades quickly matched that of the droid general who opened up four lightsabers and pressed his assault. Trevor and Tyvoka studied themselves into combat with Grievous. They knew of his stories and how ruthless he could be. This duel would be one of patience and playing out until they won. Despite the Masters teaming up on Grievous, they knew Anakin would hold his own. After all of his years training with Tyvoka, Anakin was light on his feet and heavy with his strikes. He quickly countered everything Ventress threw at him, and similar to how Tyvoka trained him, he pushed her backwards. Ventress was nothing to mock when it came to lightsaber combat, but this depicted the effectiveness of Tyvoka's instructions. Dooku watched the Jedi push and he saw Ventress begin to struggle. Skywalker would be his target then. He knew Grievous would fare well against the likes of Tyvoka. He lunged forward at Skywalker, who slumped backwards, allowing Dooku's blade to pass where his neck used to be. Anakin parried the next strike, but immediately realized that Dooku was just as skilled as Tyvoka said he was. Their blades moved at the speed of light. Tyrannus was fast on his feet, and Anakin was able to match the energy and precision of his opponent. But with Ventress re-engaging, the fight became even more challenging. Across the bridge, Tyvoka slammed his blade forward, and with such raw strength and rage, it shoved Grievous into a control panel, which dropped the capital ship out of hyperspace, ripping the hyperdrive in the shreds and destroying the reactor of the ship, causing it to lay dead in space. Left adrift to what could be seen in the bridge viewport as a small moon. All the duelists were thrown from their feet when the ship dropped out of hyperspace, and then they quickly popped up to continue their fights. Skywalker kicked Ventress back into a control panel, where she was lodged for a hot second, having to maneuver her way out. As she tried to get out, Skywalker sold out Dooku and pressed forward against him. Tyrannus was surprised with Skywalker's direct assault, but Anakin pressed with every fiber of his being, pushing Dooku into the defense. Tyvoka fought with fury against Grievous, looking to Trevor and telling him to aid Skywalker. The Jedi Master didn't want to, but he listened, seeing Ventress sneak out and prepare to kill Anakin from behind. As she lunged into the air, Trevor threw his hands forward and launched her across the room and into a wall. He then ran after Skywalker. Grievous, on the other hand, fought Tyvoka, who by this point assisted Coleman in removing both Grievous' hands. The droid general had two blades left, and as their duel continued far from Dooku, Anakin, and Coleman, Tyvoka was disarmed. His blade fell to the ground, and Grievous raised his weapon, striking down at the Jedi Master. But the Wookiee Jedi had other ideas, throwing his massive arms up and catching the droid general in his grip. Grievous tried spinning his wrists, but the Jedi held them in his hands. The Wookiee Jedi let out an audio receptor breaking the war. Grievous fell back as his hands were hoisted above his head. For the first time, perhaps ever in his warrior life, he felt true terror. Tyvoka clenched his fist with all of his strength, penetrating his hands with metal and crushing both wrists of Grievous at once. Tyvoka kicked his leg forward, breaking through Grievous' chest piece, before releasing his grip on Grievous' hands. 
Tavoka stood over the droid general, holding the two lightsabers that once belonged to Jedi. Tavoka then told him that he would perish by the blaze he once held as trophies. Grievous wailed in terror before his cries were silenced. Anakin and Coleman threw their blades forward at Dooku, and he parried everything, using all of his master to beat them back and defend himself. As Dooku was fending them off, he watched Ventress try to stand against Tyvoka before she was crushed under the weight of his strike. Everything fell apart. While it didn't make sense in reality, Dooku watched his ship fall to the surface and believed his rebellion, his life's work was crumbling before his eyes, and he didn't consider that the rest of the fleet was actually in hyperspace. Anakin pressed his blade forward against Dooku's blade, and Coleman followed, where Dooku used the force to block Coleman's strike. Dooku was stuck, and then he felt the beaten hand of a Wookiee wrap around his neck and without a moment to react, his life was snapped out of existence. The Jedi looked to each other, and they saw the moon coming closer. They would soon enter the gravitational pull of the planet. Anakin would rush with them, leading the group back to their ship and helping them back to Coruscant. Before they left, they sent a signal to Coruscant to inform them of the invasion fleet. The lead admiral would get the message, and immediately deploy the fleet into defensive positions. Despite their warning and even their return to Coruscant, the battle would go as planned for Dooku. The clones and Jedi struggled as the battle progressed across the day. On the ground, the assault that once belonged to Ventress made its mark, targeting the temple and the senate building. Their tanks fired and holes filled the buildings, but without proper leadership, the Jedi and the clones were able to make the counters necessary. The siege of Coruscant would last for three days, and when the fourth day came around, the Separatists were driven away from the city. The ruins left behind had casualties in the millions, and the Republic was able to barely win the battle. The Senate was in ruins, and the temple was damaged, but so were the skyscrapers and civilian targets. The people immediately called for a ceasefire, but there were also those who called for a complete destruction of the Separatists, which would not be able to be done. The CIS government was outraged. The truth about Dooku's fate hadn't been revealed yet, and they assumed he was in command of the attack on Coruscant, the one that was so vile and targeted people. While many people had an issue with the Republic, the attack on civilian targets were unwarranted. The CIS movement was for political change, not merciless killing. Instead of the Republic having the call for a ceasefire, the CIS did. This wasn't a surrender, because they, despite technically losing the Battle of Coruscant, were winning the war. The politicians wanted to make right of their failure to represent their people. Jedi and clones worked together to pick up the pieces of Coruscant, while the Senate, led by Senator Amidala, would meet with Mina Bontiri and her allies to discuss the end of the war. These discussions would take place on Ryloth, the Ryloth Accords, a place that was still neutral and unaffected by the war at this point. Both sides would come to a resolution, a plan to separate both the Republic and CIS, give them three years to work out their problems and come to a solution one that wouldn't force them to endure the war. Because the Clone Wars, despite being seven months old, was full of destruction. Dooku had gone unchecked because the corporations that controlled the CIS military were banking off the war, and like the Republic, these corporations had too much power inside that government. Truly ironic, the CIS was fighting exactly what they were. Eventually, they would settle their differences and come to peace. After a decade of bickering, they would restructure into the Intergalactic Republic a system that strived to positively impact the entire galaxy, and potentially, other galaxies in the future. Anakin would harbor his feelings for Padme, but at some point, the two of them would rekindle and the fire wouldn't be there. Skywalker considered an emotional connection with another person, but he wasn't desperately searching for it. As a knight, he would find time to sneak off to go to Tatooine to visit his mother, and eventually, after his return, he would take on his own Padawan, this one being Ahsoka. All new students had been sidelined until the war came to a conclusion, simply due to how serious it got so quickly. Tyvoka would stay on the council and watch over Anakin's training of Ahsoka with joy. Their bond wouldn't ever negatively be changed from what it was now. It would evolve, but only for the better. As for the Jedi, despite them getting rid of the Sith and publicly making them villains, they had a lot of learning to do, not just about the galaxy they were helping put back together, but themselves. Eventually, Master Tyvoka would rise to the seat of Grand Master, and his seat would be replaced by Master Skywalker after years of training and maintaining a strong relationship with his master. With Skywalker taking the seat, Plo continued his own journeys as an archivist with Dracosta Noom, helping spread out the Jedi to other outposts around the galaxy. Before Grandmaster Tyvoka's life came to an end, he would see a healing galaxy. While he might not ever see its peak, his final student would have the pleasure of enjoying a galaxy full of hope and freedom from the deceit of the Sith. And that, my friends, is our Grand Tier story. 
Again, special thanks to all the patrons, Benjamin Wells, Jenga Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Dark Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galavin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir Willem, 1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo Wee Wee 67, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Town, Johnny Daguin, Sans the Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Young Lee Slayer 66, Mad Mad Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark C46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button, support otherwise, go check the Patreon, cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. We've done a bunch of Anakin being trained ones, and I think this one is my personal favorite, aside from maybe the Yoda one. Having Anakin stay as cocky and headstrong as he is in canon with Tyvoka, I thought would be interesting, and mixing that with a Wookiee temper, I thought would allow their bond to just go on a different trajectory. I think Tyvoka is an interesting Jedi because he's both Wookiee and Jedi, and he's got that temper of a Wookiee, and so I wanted that to be very prevalent in some of the experiences Anakin had with his master. Obviously, an alternative to this, a what-if of a what-if, could be Anakin going down the dark path after Tyvoka snaps. But I wanted Tyvoka to be basically everything Anakin needed, the perfect mix of true Jedi and also not true Jedi, the thing that Qui-Gon could have been. Also, at the end, I thought it'd be fun to include Coleman Trebor in the fight because he's like always dead when the Clone Wars starts, so fun to include him. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.